chapter 28, beginning from verse 10 to the end of the chapter. Jacob's dream at Bethel. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. The second reading from the book of Acts, chapter 19, beginning from verse one to seven. Paul in Ephesus. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were a bad 12 men in all. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Harold. Please stand for the gospel reading. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John, chapter 1, beginning at verse 43. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth 
Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. And as you're sitting down, I just want to encourage you to think about what was the greatest revelation of Jesus Christ you have personally received. A few come to mind for myself. I remember when I first received the Holy Spirit. My friend said to me, have you ever received the Holy Spirit and made the Lord Lord of your life? And I said, I'd never heard of such a thing. I didn't know that you could receive the Holy Spirit. And they said, would you like to receive him today and pray this prayer? And I said, yes. And I just remember after that, it was like my eyes were opened. I was spiritually alive. My life changed from that moment on and I lived to follow Jesus. Best revelation ever. About 10 years later, I was uh, invited to lead a Bible study group. It was a very large organisation, this Bible study. And I was encouraged to pray and discern if I should be a leader there or not. And in praying and seeking to discern the Lord's will, I prayed and I prayed and I was getting no guidance in my hopeless estate i said to god god do you want me to teach this bible study or not and i thought i'll just open up my bible randomly shut my eyes and point my finger and see what god had to say to me that day do you know what my finger landed on the word yes <laughs> in a whole bible what are the chances and i just thought you know little Doubting Thomas, <laughs> laying out the fleas, says, okay, well, if it was a no, could it have been a no? And I just looked down and a couple words over was the word no. It was that verse, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And I just thought, wow, you know, God cares. He gave us revelation of himself in little ways, in big ways. He wants to be involved in every area of our life. And another example of a, a revelation was about seven years ago when my daughter and I wanted to go to Africa on a mission trip and there was just no money. We had done all this fundraising and I said to my daughter, look, even with all the fundraising, we can't both go. So I'm going to back out and we'll pay for you to go. Only one of us can go. And she said, look, I believe we're both meant to go. We're both going to go and we're not going to have to pay anything. And under my breath, I sort of scoffed and I thought, foolish girl, you don't know how the world of economy works. And <laughs> but next thing, next day, in fact, her friend rang up and said, I've won two tickets to Johannesburg and I'm giving them to you, which was just God's miraculous intervention, a revelation of God that he cares about life and situations and where we're at. And he equips us and enables us to do what he calls us to do. And so we did both get those tickets to Johannesburg and the, the company giving the prize of this um, trip to Johannesburg threw in the trip to Ndola as well. They took us extra further and uh, paid for the whole trip then and then in exchange just for a story of what we're doing in Africa. It was just the most amazing experience. So I don't know if you've had revelations of God like that in any way, shape or form, but we know Nathaniel did in this Bible story today. And so let's get into that now, beginning at the start, at verse 43. When Jesus decides to leave to Gal for Galilee this day, he finds Philip. And he just says to Philip, follow me. Philip leaves everything because, you know, following Jesus in those days 
or following anyone for that matter was not like Instagram or a click of a button or you just, you know, like them a bit or <laughs> just, you know, you just, it was a life changing event. You choose to follow them, you lay down your life and you learn from them, you walk with them, you journey with them. That's what following Jesus is all about. And Philip is prepared to do this. And I like that he joined Andrew and Peter the day before. Andrew and Peter, Simon and Peter, both decided themselves to follow Jesus. They left John the Baptist. They said, Jesus, where are you staying? We want to follow you. And, uh, and Jesus claimed them as his disciples. They became disciples or learners or followers of Jesus. These words are interchangeable. And here Philip is a friend of theirs. They're all from Bethsaida. They're all following Jesus together. And the first thing that Philip does when Jesus asks him to follow him is Go find Nathaniel. First thing he does. Goes and finds Nathaniel. And he says, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He's so excited to have just found Jesus. He's had his own revelation of who Jesus is. He recognises as him as the Messiah, the Saviour. He chooses to follow him and he says to Nathaniel, come, you've got to see. Come and see. We've found the Messiah. This is so exciting. This is the biggest revelation of my life. You need to find this out for yourself too. And of course, uh, Nathaniel has doubts. He says, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? I spoke a few weeks ago about the, the town of, you know, it's a little bit of disregard. Gentiles went through there. Roman soldiers stayed there. Jews and um, the Israelites didn't like that. They liked more a pure, you know, environment just with the Jewish people. It was on the trade route. A town of disrepute or repute. Nathaniel says, can anything good come from there? And Philip says, come and see. I love that. Now, all of us as disciples, as Jesus followers, do we share that same excitement? Do we want to tell all our friends and our family, oh, you should have seen what Jesus did. You know, can I tell you about this? Come and read the Bible because that's how we come and see about Jesus today. If we want to invite someone to come and see Jesus, we can't take him to them to him in person because he's not physically here with us today but spiritually is we have to invite them to come and spiritually see who Jesus is we need to open the scriptures to them now I don't know if you've done that a lot lately I haven't done it a lot lately but that's why I'm excited about doing the bible um, uh, discovery course next year and building a discipling culture we're going to invite people just to read the bible with us read a passage with them let Jesus do his work and open their eyes so that they can meet him. All we have to do is say, come and see. And Jesus gives the revelation of himself to them. That's all we need to do. We don't need to argue them into the kingdom of God. We don't need to urge them to come to church. We just need to say, come and meet Jesus. Let me tell you about him in the scripture. Let's open the scriptures together and see what we can find out about Jesus. And people are hungry for that, let me tell you. They are open to Jesus. People love Jesus. He was radical. You know, I've got a friend who's an atheist. Every time I see him, he says, tell me more stories about Jesus. He's just never heard of such a radical being, the way he lived, what he did, what he stood for. He's attractive in anyone's language. Maybe not so much church. We don't say, come to church, you'll find Jesus. Hopefully, if the preacher says something good, or, and we don't say to new converts, okay, well, just come to church and sit here for, you know, a few years while you grow and mature as a Christian and become more holy and then you can go out and witness to others. The church has made that mistake for too many years. I say, if you know Jesus, if you've had a revelation of Jesus in whatever capacity, you have something to invite others to find out to. And you don't have to convert them, as I said. You just need to invite them to come and meet Jesus. Look at the scripture with me. I did that with a lady at Greensboro Shopping Centre after said Bible study, which I did end up leading. I sat down one day at Greensboro Plaza. It was a busy day. There was no more tables in the food court. I asked an elderly lady if I could share her table, and she said yes. 
She said, where have you been? I said, I've been at Bible study. She goes, oh, I've been thinking about the Bible. What did you, what did you look at? And she just asked questions and I answered questions. She ended up becoming a Christian there and then. And it turns out she lived around the corner from my house. She didn't have a Bible. I took her a Bible and I went to meet with her weekly and we studied the scriptures together. It's amazing. If God has his finger on someone, if God has a plan, all you need to do is say, here's Jesus. Come see Jesus. Jesus does the revealing. He reveals himself. It's really, really simple. Amen. Said Bible study already too. Uh, after a while, I knew that I had become a Christian when I received the Spirit. My sister, I knew she uh, thought she was a Christian. We were both growing up in the same household. We both thought we were Christians, but she didn't know about the Spirit. She hadn't made Jesus Lord of her life. And uh, I thought this was an opportunity to come along to this said Bible study. Come and study the Bible. Just, just give it three weeks. If you don't like it, don't come course she loved it I knew she would and uh, she just yeah ended up giving her life you know growing closer to Jesus getting greater revelation through that Bible study and gave herself to Christ and she's a radical Christian now my sister I love her to bits and so like all I'm saying is all we're asked as disciples is to make disciples that's your job it's what Philip did straight away Nathaniel came and he saw him here's what he saw when he came when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. I just want to briefly say here, that's a reference to Jacob. There's a second reference later on, which I'll bring up. But remember Jacob, the, the story of the Old Testament, which we heard part of. Jacob stole his brother's birthright, took Esau's birthright. He was a deceiver. There was a lot of deceit in Jacob and, uh, and we'll hear a bit more about that later but here in contrast Nathaniel here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit how do you know me Nathaniel asked and Jesus answered I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you I love that Jesus knew where Nathaniel was. Jesus knows where each of us are every single moment, every single day. He loves you. He cares about you. He's with you. He knows just what to say to speak into your life, just to reveal himself to you. You know, he did a, this story reminds me a little bit of Augustine. I don't know if you know a bit of his story. He's one of the church fathers. And like uh, Nathaniel was under a fig tree, and Jesus knew that he was under a fig tree when Philip called him. And uh, Nathaniel got this revelation of God there. He says, you know, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Same as Augustine. He was sitting under a fig tree in his backyard, weeping, and God revealed himself to him. Do you mind if I read you a little bit of that story? I'm going to read it uh, from chapter 12 of his confessions because the language is beautiful. It, it's poet, poetic. It's poetry and it's beautiful and I couldn't do it justice if I just rambled on in my own words. So I'll be looking down and hopefully see I do need glasses. Now when deep reflection had drawn up out of the secret depths of my soul all my misery and had heaped it up before the sight of my heart, there arose a mighty storm accompanied by mighty rain of tears that I might give way fully to my tears and lamentation. I stole away from Elpius, for it seemed to me that solitude was more appropriate for the business of weeping. I went far enough away that I could feel that even his presence was no restraint on me. This was the way I felt at the time, and he realised it. I suppose I had said something before I started up and he noticed the sound of my voice was choked with weeping. And so he stayed alone where we had been sitting together, greatly astonished. I flung myself down under a fig tree, how I know not, and gave free course to my tears. The streams of my eyes gushed out an unacceptable sacrifice to thee. And not indeed in these words, but to this effect, I cried to thee, and thou, O Lord, how long, how long, O Lord, will thou be angry forever? 
I remember not against us our former iniquities, for I felt that I was still enthralled by them. I sent up these sorrowful cries, how long, how long? Tomorrow and tomorrow, why not now? Why not this very hour make an end to my uncleanness? I was saying these things and weeping in the most bitter contrition of my heart when suddenly I heard the voice of a boy or girl, I know not which, coming from the neighbouring house, chanting over and over again, pick it up, read it, pick it up, read it. Immediately I ceased weeping and began most earnestly to think whether it was usual for children in some kind of game to sing such a song, but I could not remember having heard it like. So damning the torrent of my tears, I got to my feet, for I could not but think this was a divine command to open up the Bible and read the first passage I should light upon. For I had heard how Anthony, accidentally coming into a church while the gospel was being read, received the admonition as if it was read, had been addressed to him, go sell what you have and give it to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. By such an oracle, he was forthwith converted to thee. So I quickly returned to the bench where Elpius was sitting, for there I had put down the apostle's book when I had left there. I snatched it up, opened it, and in silence read the paragraph on which my eyes first fell. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, envying but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfil the lust thereof. I wanted to read no further, nor did I need to. For instantly, as the sentence ended, there was infused in my heart something like the light of full certainty and all the gloom of doubt vanished away. Closing the book then, and putting my finger or something else for a mark, I began now with a tranquil countenance to tell it all to Elpius. And he in turn disclosed to me what had been going on for himself, of which I knew nothing. He asked to see what I read. I showed him. And he looked on even further than I had read. I had not known what followed, but indeed it was this. Him that is weak in faith, receive. This he applied to himself and told me so. But these words of warning strengthened him, and by exercising his good resolution and purpose, all very much in keeping with his character, in which, in these respects, he was always far different and better than I, he joined me in a full commitment without any reckless hesitation. Then we went to my mother and told her what happened to her great joy. We explained to her how it had occurred, and she leapt for joy triumphant and she blessed thee. Able to do exceedingly abundant above all we can ask or think, she said, for she saw that thou hadst granted her far more than she had ever asked for in all her pitiful and doleful lamentation. For thou didst so convert me to thee that I sought neither a wife nor any other of this world's hopes, but set my feet on that rule of faith which was for so many years before had shown her in a dream about me. And so thou did turn her grief into gladness, more plentiful than she had ventured to desire, and dearer and purer than the desire she used to cherish of having grandchildren of my flesh. It's amazing, isn't it? Amazing conversion to Augustine. So in his courtyard, knowing he was a guilty sinner, God came to him in his lamenting, gave a fresh revelation of himself and changed his life forever. What he did to Nathaniel in this passage, what he does for us when we come to him. And just as Augustine became a disciple, a closer follower of Jesus that day, so Nathaniel did this day when Jesus spoke into his life. Now we don't know what Nathaniel was doing under the tree. We don't know if he was praying, uh, lamenting, the forgiveness of sins, seeking God or seeking a rabbi to follow. 
We don't know, but Jesus know, knew and spoke directly into his life, right where he was at, with what he needed to hear. And so he declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus said, you believe because I told you, I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Does that remind you of Jacob's Ladder, yeah? Well, the, the first reading and, um, and yeah, when Jacob was fleeing from his brother Esau and going to Haran to find a wife because he was sent away for stealing his brother's birthright as he did deceitfully. In his travels he came to a place called Bethel and it was late and he was tired so he lay down his head on a stone to sleep and during the night he dreamed of a staircase to heaven where angels came up and down and God spoke to him and said, you know, you are going to have descendants and land and all the promises of Abraham and Isaac will go to you, Jacob. God met him there and gave him a great revelation of God himself. So when, when he woke up in the morning, he declared, this is God's house. This is where God meets people and he named the place Bethel. And so what Jesus is saying here, when Jesus is saying basically that allusion to, to Jacob's ladder, I am now the place where people will get a revelation of me, of God. This is where people will find God, the revelation of God. And this is where God will reveal his plans for them through the Son of God, the Son of Man, as he's named in this passage, which carries overtones of authority and power and glory as seen in Daniel 7. And so Jesus is telling Nathanael, and the other disciples there, Simon Peter and Philip and Andrew and all of us today, that he is the place where God reveals himself to us, where he reveals his plans to us and it's all through Jesus Christ. So the greater thing that would be revealed to them and to us is the revelation of God in the life and the ministry and the death and the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the greatest thing any of us will ever see. His story is the most remarkable you will ever hear. His love is the greatest you will ever receive. His power is the greatest you'll ever experience. His authority is the greatest there is. And his glory goes beyond anything you can imagine. In response to knowing that, what do you want to do? We just want to go tell others, say, come and see. Come and see the amazing God. Should be our first response. It was the first response of that woman at the well. Remember that lady? She was out, a woman of ill repute, um, you know, had many, many husbands. Jesus met her at the well. She's transformed by this revelation of Jesus and she goes into the town where most of the time she'd hide away from the people but she goes to the people and she says come come and see the man who told me everything I have ever done that story tells us that none of us are not able to do this we don't have to be a person of uh, no deceit like Nathaniel we don't have to be uh, like Augustine a great church father who wasn't when God revealed himself to him anyway if he does this to Nathaniel, to the woman at the well, to Augustine, to us, he'll do it for anyone. No one is beyond God's salvation. No one is beyond a revelation of God receiving that. So all we need to do is say, come, come and see. Invite people to read the Bible, look at the scriptures with you, introduce them to Jesus, and you see what he will do. That's where the exciting stuff happens, yeah? All right, we can do this, yeah? All right, you can be encouraged. Want to hear stories next week of how God used you to, um, to introduce someone to Jesus? That'll be awesome. Let me pray. Jesus, you are the greatest man who ever lived, the greatest one we've ever known, and 
I just really pray that those thoughts and understanding will overwhelm our hearts and minds and lives and come flowing out of our mouths. Lord, we have good news to share. Thank you, God, for revealing yourself through Jesus Christ, your son, and bringing us into relationship with you to follow you. We thank you that we choose to. We choose to follow you, be your disciples. And we know that should be life-changing. So help us to surrender ourselves afresh to you today to follow you, to invite others to come and see you. And we look forward in great anticipation to see what you will do in Jesus' name. Amen.